Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 28 is our assigned reading this morning. It is, uh, it is not a short passage, so uh, please let us uh, listen and give ear to God's word as it is read for us this morning. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight, then you shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head and it, with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord." The blood shall be on a sign, uh, excuse me, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought, you, uh, brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from this fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clan and kill the Passover lamb. Take a, bu a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the doors of, the, of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall ob observe this rite as a statute for you and your sons forever. 
And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. And when your children says to you, or say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the service of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. That's the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Let us pray. We'll dive right in. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that um, as we now have come to this pivotal moment in the rescue of your people, of Israel, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, and our minds to see, hear, and understand the true meaning of this Passover, uh, Father God, that we would look to the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb that has saved and rescued us, namely our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We lift this time to you now, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> and so we finally come to the 10th plague. Uh, by no means does this end our series in Exodus, but it is going to really be the beginning, I would say, uh, of our series because it is here uh, with this plague God inaugurates uh, the rescue of his people. Here between the ninth and 10th plague, I mentioned last week, we have this brief preparatory intermission where God would consolidate Israel as his people. And in this, we see that this plague will really be the last one that would break Pharaoh's heart, heart, or hard heart and release his people, or release God's people. But beloved, this plague we have here is truly pivotal, not because it will begin to open the door for Israel's exodus. It is not going to, it's not only the one that's going to be so devastating to Pharaoh and all the Egyptians that they were going to bow to the will of God. But this plague we have here is pivotal because, namely and ultimately because, God will show and God is demonstrating just how it is sinful people will find rescue and refuge from the wrath and judgment of God. God is showing what is required in order for salvation to be a reality. What is required in order for salvation to enter the pages of history when we've all proven with no exception to tribe, tongue, race, people, gender, class that we're all, every single one of us, a sinner. This is the major underpinnings of chapter 12 that God shows his gracious intervention in providing for sinners the salvation that we so desperately need. You will do well to notice that with uh, the 10th plague, we have something that is unusual. Something unusual in comparison to the previous nine, where, as in the previous nine, we're told that God makes a distinction between Israel and Egypt Re with respect to the plague. That in the previous nine, God distinguishes the region of Goshen as a place that will be sheltered from the plague that he's about to visit upon Egypt. 
But here for the first time, we do, yes, have a mention of God saying that he will distinguish between Israel and Egypt. But he doesn't say that he will preserve a particular land in Egypt. As a matter of fact, God says in chapter 11, verse 4, every firstborn in the land of Egypt, and here in chapter 12, we have God saying, in all the land of Egypt, every single nook and cranny of this nation is subject under God's judgment. Every person in the land of Egypt Therefore, that includes even the Israelites. They're not sheltered by, oh, we are part of this region of Egypt, so God will just not visit this part. But he says all, and that includes even Goshen, everybody, all the people in Egypt are sentenced to death. This plague, this tenth plague, in a ways, makes no distinction. It is a plague that does not distinguish based on a particular nation. But we will see that this plague is a distinction that is made between those that are righteous and those that are in their sin. And we can confidently say that Israel, if they have to fear, that they are, uh, they should fear. Because if this is a plague that would distinguish between the righteous and the sinner, and then it will visit every sinner, all of God's enemy, Israel has nothing to prove in regards to their righteousness. They proved even their disobedience. When Moses first came to the scene and he said he's going to go to Pharaoh and tell them exactly what God has told him to say, what did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh made their labor much harder. He made Israel stay in Egypt that much more of a thorn in their side. And how did they respond? How did they respond to Moses' announcement of their impending salvation? Did they not turn against him with indignation? Did they not curse him? Did they not disobey? And did they not prove that even in their own hearts they were... They were wrestling with their own idolatrous ways. Every single person in the land of Egypt equally was deserving of their wages of sin. Every single person even if it was not for this particular sin that, he, that Israel committed, and I'm sure this is not the only thing that they did that offended God, but if there is anything, it is the fact that even Israel is of the human race, just like Egypt. That means just like Egypt, they also equally inherit Adam's guilt, and therefore she can't avoid, she can't avoid death. Beloved, I wanted to see here, every single one of us, the fact that this 10th plague, the plague of death, is one that doesn't distinguish between particular nation, tribe, people, group, or nation, but that it is one that distinguishes between who is holy and who are sinners, and it is the sinner that God will strike with this plague. Every single one of us, you and I included, have offended God and have violated His holiness. Like Israel, Egypt, Adam, we are all guilty, every single one of us. It 
if you have not if you haven't proved that in your disobedience if you haven't proven that in your own self sufficient pride if you haven't proven that in our constant struggle and wrestling with our idols if we haven't proven that in the fact that we always compromise our affection that should solely be for God for other things in this world where instead of allowing God's word to direct our lives we're so prone to allowing whatever is governing our affection and motivations to do so do we not prove it in this that we are indeed equally liable and guilty and in the final analysis because our sin speaks so loudly accuses us so loudly of our guilt that we can't that we too can't avoid death the announcement of the 10th the 10th plague should not only make israel let alone egypt but every single one of us conscious of our sins make us all aware of our guilt and make us all tremble for we are liable to judgment especially as this judgment is an undeniable reality god does not make any distinctions but wait didn't we just preach last week about how god does make distinctions Verse chapter 11 verse 7 doesn't God say that he distinguishes between Israel and Egypt Yes you are indeed right he does But like I said and as we see in chapter 12 this distinction is only made between who deserves death and who does not And so chapter 12 becomes for us of how it is exactly God will now make that distinction between who will be spared and who will be judged. God will distinguish Israel not because they are inherently or intrinsically a special people that they are somehow spared and because or because they're guiltless or they are without blemish no god in chapter 12 is setting up the stage in which and how he will provide that distinction how he's going to distinguish between a people that deserves to die and those that deserve to be spared and we see that the fact that god prescribes this passover through which they are going to be saved that if it was not for god's provision then none would be spared all would die beloved we see here in the introduction and in the first passover that israel's salvation yours and my salvation is not because of anything in you or me We have to be mindful that Israel is not distinguished because she's guiltless. 
But it is precisely when she has proven to be so guilty that God provides a way out. We must be mindful in the fact that you and I are cherished and favored in God's eyes. Not because of anything that is in, intrinsically or inherently in you and me. Because if there's anything that is intrinsically or inherently in you and me, that thing is only and it is only guilt. It is only sin. It is only proof that we deserve the wages of that sin. The only reason then Israel is spared, the only reason you and I are spared is because God makes a provision. He prescribes the provision through which you and I can be saved. If it was not for this, there is no distinction. If it's not for this, there is no salvation. Israel, Egypt, you, me, we're all alike. I think too many of us, too many of us, the reason why we take God's provision for our salvation so lightly. The reason why you and I think so lightly about Christ and about his sacrifice and how his coming is the most gracious provision that God could ever make to sinners like you and me who deserve nothing but death. The reason why we think so lightly tread upon it is because you and I are still convinced that somehow we are guiltless, that we are and that we have in no way offended God, that we are without sin. Perhaps Israel began to think that way too. The fact that God chose them and kept preserving them throughout the plagues, that somehow they grew in pride thinking, oh, something must be special about me. Something must be so special about us that God should spare us. But here God shows them, if it is not for his provision, then every single one in Egypt would die. Beloved, if it is not for God's provision, you have nowhere to go, you have nothing to stand on to save you. It is time for us to stop thinking that you and I are so special, so unique, so different that God should think of you any otherwise. The only way God will distinguish you from the rest of the world that is condemned is only if we trust and trust only in provision that he makes. Beloved, what, what are you banking on? What are you banking on that the blood of Christ does not burn a fire in your belly, this white hot flame to live every day with the zeal and passion to know him and to love him. What are you banking on every day that your love for Christ is so cold, so lukewarm? What are you looking to to save you and spare you from the wrath of God? Because there's no other reason 
that upon hearing God's gracious provision of Christ for you and me to save us. There's no reason why that news should not rattle us to our core, changing our very motivation and affection unless we trust in something else more than Christ to do this. So I ask you, what is it that you look to to spare you from God's wrath if it is not Christ? Blood shed for you. Beloved, in the words of a renowned pastor of perhaps the most renowned pastor in the 20th century, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the greatest pastor and evangelist, I admonish you to consider Christ. Only by the blood of the Lamb is Israel spared from death. It is a, it is a scene familiar to many of us. But I want us to dive a little deeper. Now imagine this. God says, let every household take for themselves a yearling lamb without blemish. Now, this is not the size of, you know, a, 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 a small city. But Israel has grown so big that they themselves can become their own nation. Now, imagine every single household getting for themselves a yearling lamb. That's a lot of lamb. Now imagine on the 14th day of the month, every single household would slaughter that lamb. Envision the sight. Blood, guts everywhere. It is absolutely atrocious. So bloody. So violent. I'm sure at this moment, Israel realized not only what it took to save them from death, but just what it took in order for God's wrath to be satisfied. Just how grievous and disgusting their offenses to God really is. That God does not take the violation of his holiness lightly. This is what they deserved. Rather, in their place, it was the lamb that took their death. And so they would take the blood of the lamb and spread it on the doorposts and the lintel of their houses. Afterward, sacrificing the lamb, burning it and roasting it, they would eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Unleavened bread because it would be a sign for them that their life would be empty of sin. Unleavened bread, unadulterated, pure bread signifying that they are a people that is to be without blemish themselves and sinless. But also a sign showing that their rescue is imminent. That they are to prepare the bread in haste. No time to wait for it to leaven. Prepare the bread in haste. Eat it in haste because their salvation is imminent. To eat it this way was them trusting that their salvation was coming soon. 
They were also to eat it with bitter herbs, signifying the bitter bondage under which they had been rescued. And all of this, this meal was to be a perpetual memorial meal to remind them from where they have been saved and who they are now. But the highlight that preserves them to be this kind of people is the Lamb's blood. The Passover is pivotal because, beloved, we see not only in the pages of history how God saves Israel, how what is required in order for the death that we deserve in order for God's wrath and judgment to pass over not only Israel, but to pass over you and me. There is nothing to satisfy that wrath but the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. And not just any blood of any Lamb, but the blood of the Lamb that God provides. Namely, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what this Passover foreshadows. It is a substitute. You and I need a substitute. You and I need a substitute that will be sacrificed in our place for our sin. And it is only when we hide behind the veil, the blood of the one that substitutes in our place, there and only there can you and I be saved. And that is why with the coming of Christ, the opening announcement given by the final prophet that will close the age of the prophets, John the Baptist, he says, behold the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. Isaiah 53, 7. Isaiah prophesying about the coming Messiah talks about the Messiah in this way. The lamb that is led to the slaughter. Beloved, whose Let me put it another way. Beloved, where? In whom? Can you hide? It's very black and white. It is those who are under the blood of a substitute or those who would trust in themselves. It is the blood of the Lamb, or it is not. And it is only those that are under and in and living through that blood that is spared. Everyone else, they could, they could have been hiding in any house. They could have been hiding in a basement. They could have been hiding in a closet. Any house, I'm sure Egyptians, as, as soon as people begin seeing bodies falling on the streets and in the roads, they began running to their houses for shelter, for refuge. But if the blood of the lamb was not on the door of that house, no matter how deep into the house they ran, they all, they all experienced death. God has made a way. God has made a way to make that distinction sure that it is Christ or it is not. It is in Jesus or it is not. Will you trust in the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you God showed it in Egypt. He showed it in Calvary. 
that it is a blood of a lamb, but not a yearling lamb, not just any lamb, but the Lamb of God, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. It is only by His blood shed for you and me that you and I have salvation. You and I in the fountain of His blood are made righteous. You and I behind the veil of his blood, his broken body. You and I not just have the privilege of being addressed as God's people, but there you and I are brought into that new life where we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. Beloved, death befalls us all. Who will you look to for your escape and your shelter from what you and I deserve? God has clearly made that provision. The one who is just to judge has made that provision. It is there or it is nowhere else, or it is nowhere. I pray that we would begin to understand the depth and the riches of God's love for you and me, that while we prove to be full of guilt and sin, that he delighted to even make a distinction. And so to do so, he provides for you a savior our Lord Jesus. May we all hide in him, trust in him, and rest in him, and know from this day forward joy and life everlasting.